Good afternoon, and welcome to the patient webinar hosted by MHouse. My name is Tina Rolis, and I am here with MHouse Executive Director Diane Doherty and our guest speaker, Jenny Gertz. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few things to help this webinar go as smoothly as possible for everyone. First, let's be sure everyone can hear us. If you can hear us, click on the hand symbol in the control panel in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. I'll give everybody just a moment to do that. Okay, great. Now, let's go over some housekeeping slides. This orange arrow on the control panel will allow you to open and close the panel. The questions box is where you will submit any questions that you might have. Our goal is to answer every question that comes in, but if by chance we don't get to yours, don't worry. We will respond either in the chat or via email. This webinar is being recorded and will be placed on our website at a later date. We're excited to be providing this webinar today for MH susceptible patients and their family members. The topic that we will be discussing is genetics and what it means to you and your family to be MH susceptible. Jenny, it's so nice of you to volunteer your time to help us with this webinar. Please take a moment to introduce, your, introduce yourself to our audience. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation, Tina and Diane. My name is Jenny Gertz. I'm a genetic counselor at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. I've been working with the MHAUS organization for about over 10 years now, um, originally on the board of directors and more recently as a genetics liaison that helps answer all questions genetics that come into the organization. So, Great, without thank you. <laughs> also, during this webinar, we will be testing your knowledge of MH with a few random poll questions. Be sure to watch for them as you will have a limited time to answer. Let's get started with our first poll question. Have you or anyone in your family ha had genetic testing for MH? Okay. Just going to give a few seconds for everybody to submit their answer. I'll give it about five more seconds. Okay. It looks like 57% of our audience said no, they have not had a genetic test, but 43% has. Great. Thank you. Jenny? Wonderful. So I'm glad to hear there's a bit of a mix in the audience today, some who have had some experience, some who haven't. So um, the topics we're going to be discussing, for some of you, you, you may have heard um, or, or know, be very familiar with these things before. I'd like to cover the genetics of malignant hypothermia, uh, the genetic counseling aspects, the genetic testing options and the muscle biopsy testing, and the testing strategy, so how we go about offering testing for interested families. So just to give a little bit of a primer, a background, so that we're all on the same page as far as the uh, pathophysiology of the disease. So when I'm talking about genetics, I'm of course speaking about the genes, the DNA that's inside of our bodies. And each gene encodes to make a certain protein. These proteins then go on to make up the cells and tissues in our body and the organs that carry out a certain function. So in the case of um, malignant hypothermia, what we know is it's due to a genetic mutation. And the word mutation is saying that there's a change in the gene that leads to an altered protein function, meaning typically then that protein is not working the way that it should because of that genetic mutation that's inherited. And because it's inherited, it can be passed on to children and it's present in all cells. So the inheritance pattern for malignant hypothermia is something called autosomal dominant. So meaning, 
in most cases, there is a parent that carries the gene mutation as well. And because we have two copies of all of our genes, we get one from mom and one from dad, it's a 50-50 chance to pass the gene mutation on to the next generation. So in the image on the left, you can see that autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. And then in the image on the right is how we draw out family histories. It's something called a pedigree. And one of the things that is important to recognize with malignant hypothermia is that having the gene that predisposes you to malignant hypothermia does not guarantee that you would have an MH episode. So in the example of the picture on the right, you'd see here the, uh, the um, images with orange are folks that have MH susceptible, and the folks in blue are folks that have had an MH episode, okay? So all the orange and blue individuals would carry the gene from malignant hypothermia, but only the ones in blue actually had an episode. So this is something called, a scientific term called incomplete penetrance, meaning having the gene doesn't guarantee you would have the episode, okay? So, and one of the reasons for that is there's really a multifactorial cause for malignant hyperthermia. The gene is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, we believe there are probably other genetic factors, genetic modifiers that may influence whether or not someone has an event in addition to the environmental factors. So, um, you know, obviously if there's a, a triggering agent the person is exposed to, how their body physiologically responds to that triggering agent, all of those things together really determine the likelihood that someone would have an MH event. And much of this area of understanding is still being researched. So we still have a lot to learn about the genetic modifiers and environmental factors that what that actually cause someone to have an MH event. Okay, so I'd like to take a moment here to ask for questions, and specifically around the inheritance. I know that that can be confusing for people. The thought that you can have a gene, but it's not actually causing the disease at all times, only in certain instances would they actually have an MH event. Okay, um, Jenny, this is Diane. I don't see any questions as of yet around this particular part of the presentation, so I think we can probably move forward. Wonderful. And we've got a poll question for you. Okay, let's get to our second poll question. Who is the best first contact if you are considering the MH genetic test? As before, I'll give a few seconds to, to have everybody submit their answer. And I'll give about uh, five more seconds. Okay, it looks like 25% of our audience said that your insurance company is the best first contact, 13% said your doctor, and 63% said a genetic counselor. Jenny? Okay, so again, another good mixed response. Um, there's not really a wrong uh, answer to that question. I think it's which one give, will give you the least headache. <laughs> so contacting the insurance company, of course, cost is always going to be a concern. Um, but oftentimes the patient themselves doesn't have the information needed to find out about insurance coverage. And so it can be a real headache for the patient to try to navigate the CPT codes, which are the billing codes. Uh, the ICD-10 codes, which are the diagnostic codes. Um, so really, the genetic counselor helps facilitate that um, in the laboratory where any testing is being done. Um, the doctor is also a, a good first 
step. Um, as many of you on the line may know, um, for the most part, primary care physicians are, are unaware of malignant hypothermia. Um, one of the many initiatives MHAUS is working on is educating uh, physicians and care providers, uh, but typically they're not familiar enough with the condition to know what testing to offer or, or really know what the next steps would be to assess risk. Um, so I think for me, of course I'm biased because I am a genetic counselor, but I think the, the simplest thing to do is really start with a genetic counselor. And certainly you can talk to your doctor about getting a referral to a genetic counselor if that's required for your insurance, because um, it's always good to make sure the primary care doctor knows what's going on. And the genetic counselor will, of course, um, res um, talk with the primary care doctor about you know, what's discussed at the appointment and if any testing is ordered and the results of that test and the interpretation of that test will all go back to the primary care doctor and treating physician. So, okay, great. All right, so now to talk a little bit more about genetic counseling. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the process, it's really helping people understand um, and adapt to the medical, uh, psychological, and familial implications of the genetic contributions to disease. And we are really are facilitating that genetic testing process so that patients know what they're at risk for, what the testing can tell us, what it can't tell us, and importantly, how to properly interpret those results for the patients and their family. So um, the, the decision making around genetic testing involves a couple of key questions. So understanding is the individual at a higher risk for the disease than the general population? Um, and will the test even give useful information, you know, what's considered useful? There may be different definitions for what's medically useful versus what's personally useful to someone in their own lives for either family planning or just life planning. Um, importantly, is this the right time in my life to be taking this test? Sometimes um, people may be going through a particularly difficult time in their life, um, be it you know, health of the individual or health of a loved one, if, if someone's recently passed away. Um, sometimes going down this road of exploring genetic testing can be emotionally exhausting. And then will the advantages gained from having the genetic information outweigh the disadvantages? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so at an appointment with a genetic counselor, um, right off the bat we start with contracting. So this is explaining you know, why the patient's referred or why they're, they're there today, having the patient explain to the provider what their expectations are for the session and setting goals. We review the medical history. Uh, we take a family history, that pedigree, that was that image with the circles and squares that I showed you earlier. Um, the risk assessment is when then we're pulling all those things together and analyzing medical and family history to assess the inheritance of the condition. Um, and then discussing genetic testing options. Um, so, you know, what is going to make sense for this scenario medically, uh, financially, and then as I mentioned before, considering the personal utility in addition to the medical utility for the genetic testing. Um, we obtain informed consent for genetic testing, and at, at the appointment is when we could address insurance concerns, coverage of the genetic testing, um, discuss genetic discrimination information, which I have more on about that in a couple of slides. Um, and then, importantly, um, the possible genetic test results and how we interpret those results. And we're going to go into that in detail in a few slides as well. Um, and then, lastly, the psychological impact of the test for the patient and family members. So, you know, unlike other medical tests, if you're just getting a, you know, CBC or a cholesterol level, you know, you really think about that only having implications for you. But with genetic testing, it obviously has implications for family. And when we talk about things being inherited and passing things on to our children, there can be a lot of strong emotions that come along with that. So we discuss those as well. So um, specifically with malignant hypothermia, during a counseling session, the information that is very important to gather is in that family history, asking about any anesthesia complications that individuals had, um, asking about neuromuscular disorders, instances of heat stroke, um, rhabdomyolysis, which is muscle breakdown, or instances of sudden unexplained death. It's important to gather all of that in the family history. 
And then as I mentioned, there are some um, regulations uh, that prohibit discrimination based on genetic test results. Um, so the most comprehensive of these uh, is a federal law that was passed in 2008. Most states also have additional protections against discrimination. Um, but the federal law, known as GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, um, considers genetic information, family history information, um, the genetic counseling, and genetic test results. And these protections are there um, against for um, health insurers and employers so that they can't use this information against somebody. However, this, in, this does not apply to life insurance, long-term care, or disability insurance. So those industries really can use any information they want to set your premiums. And you know, oftentimes when I'm talking with patients, I explain to them the best time to get life insurance is when you're young and healthy and don't have any medical issues. Um, because as we get older and different things come up like diabetes or high blood pressure, that is what those life insurance companies use to set premiums. So of course they would also consider any sort of genetic conditions as they're um, setting those premiums and eligibility. And importantly, this um, law does not apply to members of the military um, and federal employees. Um, and, and there's some exceptions for small employers where there's less than 15 employees. So as far as the genetic counseling aspects of malignant hyperthermia, if anyone has any questions, please submit them at this time. Uh, Jenny, this is Diane. We have a couple of questions that came in kind of as uh, for the previous area that I think you might want to um, address. One is my son was tested for other genetics and MH came up as susceptible. Should we assume our daughter is too? Oh. Great. So sure that's, that's kind of like an incidental finding, if you will. <laughs> um, so, uh, so with the advancements in genetic testing technology more recently, um, we've gone beyond the days of just looking for single genes. And, and many people having tests done in, in the last two, three years are having more comprehensive tests. Um, panels of genes or even a whole exome or genome sequencing where we're looking at all of the known genes. Um, and then incidentally, something crops up in a result that wasn't expected, it wasn't the original indication for the genetic testing. So um, with this can happen certainly with malignant hypothermia. So um, in, in this example, I'm guessing the, the person who submitted the question, their child was, had some sort of extensive genetic testing, um, and this popped up unexpectedly. Um, and, and I'll have patients say, well, there's no family history. How could this be true? How could there be this gene, this marker, if there's no family history? And just as I explained earlier, you know, the gene doesn't guarantee an event. Um, so it's possible there could have been other family members that were just not exposed to triggering agents or were exposed, but for whatever reason, again, that multifactorialness of it um, didn't actually, it didn't precipitate an event. Um, so if we do find an individual a test positive in the family, even if it's an in incidental finding, um, but if there's a positive genetic test in the family, we then would recommend that subsequent family members, so siblings, parents, um, be tested for the genetic marker that was identified as well. So we don't just necessarily assume that the daughter would be positive in this case because it's a 50-50 chance to pass it on. There's a 50% chance the daughter could be a carrier and the simple genetic test could tell us whether she's not is or not. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another uh, that came through. You might want to address this. It's a little lengthy. Because my son was the one who had an episode 33 years ago and my husband had a positive muscle biopsy, I felt responsible to inform the entire extended family using the MHOS sample letter. I reminded them again, but now the children are now having children. So should I send another letter to remind them, explain the genetic testing? Is there a new MHOS letter for that? I have to tell you no at the moment. Um, keep skipping on me. And how responsible should I be for future generations? <laughs> this is a great question. I get this one a lot. Um, first of all, it sounds like you, you've been very responsible um, so far, and I, I think um, 
you know, we, we struggle with this in families where we disseminate information and we give it, you know, to adults and um, we expect that they take that to their doctors and, and, and carry out, um, you know, the testing and identify if they're at risk and, and go through the necessary channels. Um, however, not everybody does that. <laughs> Unfortunately, some family members may look at the letter and say, okay, that's great, and boom, it goes into the garbage. And as much as it, you know, breaks my heart to see those things happen, um, I, I think there's only so much we can do um, besides, you know, physically taking, you know, our niece or nephew by the ear and dragging them into the doctor, you know. <laughs> um, so I, I think, you know, there's been opportunities that families have had, like um, family reunions, those types of things where the family's together or over the holidays where, you know, there can be some discussion, some, you know, information shared in, in, in the format of a letter. Um, I, I think that for for the family, it sounds like they haven't maybe had genetic testing yet. They've had the muscle contracture test. Um, so possibly um, it may be more acceptable to the family to do a genetic test, a blood test, um, rather than having everyone do the muscle contracture test. And so we'll talk about genetic testing up next and the testing strategy. So that will we'll co that will come back full circle to that. Okay, great. Um, I think that's a, um, enough at the moment. If we can move on at this point. Okay, and we've got a poll? Yep, this is our last poll. Um, let's see, okay. What portion of the genetic test for MH does an insurance company cover? I'll give everybody about 30 seconds to uh, chime in with their answer. Okay, we got about five more seconds, and I will close the poll. Okay, great. So this is pretty interesting. 15% um, of our audience said that insurance companies will either fully cover, partially cover, or not cover at all. Um, and then 54% of our audience said all of the above. Um, this was sort of a trick question. Jenny, do you want to explain a little bit? <laughs> Yeah, so insurance companies, um, they typically will use medical necessity to determine eligibility for coverage. And, and so genetic testing for, for most insurance policies is a covered benefit. There are very rarely insurance companies that have complete exclusions for genetic tests. Um, and so when they say it's a covered benefit, that doesn't guarantee payment. Um, it's usually subject to medical necessity review, either in a prior authorization or at the time of the claim that it's, it's submitted once the testing is completed. And then depending on the patient's benefits, so if the patient has a copay or deduct, unmet deductible or a coinsurance, that can kind of then determine. So typically with insurance companies, if they determine it's medically necessary, it's covered, but it may not be covered at 100% because if you haven't met your deductible and you have a 10% coinsurance, there may be some out of pocket. And again, the genetic counselor can help navigate that, um, but most insurance companies do provide genetic testing coverage when medically necessary. It's just the trick is how do we determine medical necessity because that is certainly subject to interpretation. <laughs> so. All right, so let's go on to talk about the genetic testing options. Screen waking up here. Um, okay, so the options for genetic testing include the muscle contracture test, abbreviated CHCT, the genetic test, or no testing. I wanted to throw that out there as an option too that some families do choose. So the caffeine halothane contracture test. CHCT. This still is the gold standard. This can provide a diagnosis of malignant hypothermia susceptibility. It is an invasive test. It does require a skeletal muscle biopsy, and it must be performed at an MH muscle biopsy center. And the MHAUS website has excellent page on this with resources and all the centers listed and their contact information. It is a very sensitive test, so close to 100%, meaning false negatives are rare, okay? So if the muscle contracture test is normal, 
that is a very good sign that that individual would not have an MH episode. It's not a guarantee. You know, we never guarantee things in medicine, but close to 100%. So a normal contracture test is very reassuring and essentially rules out malignant hyperthermia. Now, the specificity is about 80%. So this is where we can get some false positives. So if someone has a positive result, we would treat them as malignant hypothermia susceptible. But we do believe that some people will get a false positive on that muscle biopsy, and that's what that 20% is referring to. Okay. So with the genetic test, it's not invasive. It's just a blood draw, typically, where we're isolating DNA. Um, we can obtain DNA from other samples, from saliva, um, or other tissues in the case of if um, individuals are deceased and there was um, some post-mortem analysis, we can obtain some tissue there and do some analysis on tissue as well. Um, the main gene for malignant hyperthermia is the RYR1 gene, the aryanidine receptor gene, and we sequence this gene. So the word sequencing um, is essentially, uh, the way I explain it to patients is, um, it's like reading a book. So if a gene is a book, um, we're reading that gene looking for any sort of errors or spelling mistakes in that gene, and that's the sequencing. And the RYR1 gene sequencing will detect about 70 to 80 percent of mutations in patients who have either had an MH event or have had a positive contracture test, okay? So let me rephrase that another way. So if we have a population of 100 individuals who have all either had an MH event or an MH contract, positive contracture test, meaning they have malignant hypothermia susceptibility, out of those 100 individuals, 70 to 80 of them will have a positive genetic test meaning 20 to 30 of them will still have malignant hypothermia, but we could not identify the gene mutation. And this is one of the main reasons that genetic testing is not the gold standard test at this time, because we cannot say we can identify 100% of the genetic causes of malignant hypothermia. There is a second gene, the CACNA1S gene, um, and there's a specific mutation, a specific change in that gene that's seen in about 1% of malignant hypothermia families. So again, not a real common cause. Um, and so still for that 20 to 30% of patients with a confirmed malignant hypothermia susceptibility, we aren't able to identify the genetic cause. And this point I'll come back to as we talk about testing strategy and challenges with interpretation. So, but if we do the RYR1 gene sequencing and we actually find a mutation, that then is diagnostic for malignant hypothermia susceptibility. Okay. So in, in, in other words, um, if we do the genetic testing and we have a positive result, we find the mutation, that then is very beneficial. If it's a negative test result, that's where there's some challenges in interpretation. So I'm gonna go through the three potential genetic test results that a patient may receive if they're having genetic testing. Okay, so the scenario typically is that we would first start with the RYR1 gene sequencing, the full gene sequencing, in an individual that's had an MH event or a positive contracture test. That's the first, in, per, first person that we like to start with testing. And the three potential results are a negative result, and that means completely normal, variant of uncertain significance, the U.S., inconclusive, or positive, meaning abnormal, okay? So positive. So positive means that a pathogenic, that's another word for saying causative, mutation has been detected in the gene. This, as I mentioned, is diagnostic for MH susceptibility. And in this circumstance, we can now offer cascade testing to family members where we can go and look at you know, children, siblings, and, and start doing what we call site-specific analysis for the exact mutation that was previously identified in the family. 
So genes, as I mentioned, are like books. And so if we, they do the sequencing and they read the whole book and they find, for example, at page five, there was a letter A and G missing from page five. Then for those subsequent family members, that site-specific analysis just involved going boom, right directly to the spot on the gene where we found the mutation in the family. We don't have to reread the whole book. We just go right to that page five. That allows for a more accurate test. It gives us a, really a yes or no answer, and it's much more cost-effective. It's cheaper. Um, and in this case, if we have looked at the family history, we have an individual in the family who is, uh, has had an MH event or a positive contracture test, and we find the mutation in them, positive results. This is where then we have to um, offer testing to family members and interpret results with caution. And we're gonna talk about this, a true negative result in upcoming in a, in a little bit, okay? so. Variant of uncertain significance. This is, you know, person's tested, they do the sequencing, and the results come back inconclusive. Basically what that's saying is the laboratory does not have enough evidence to determine whether or not the particular change that they identified causes disease or is benign. More research is needed. Um, there's some functional studies, some research they usually do in cell culture work. Um, there's um, something else called co-segregation that we can do where we compare the results in other family members. It may take years to reclassify these results that are as either positive or negative. Um, and in the case of an inconclusive result, unfortunately, genetic testing is not useful for other unaffected family members. So we really are saying in this circumstance that we were not able to identify the causative mutation in the family and we're just not sure. We have to wait for more research to be done. Okay, then a negative result. So again, in the scenario where we're testing someone who's had an MH event or a positive contracture test, we do the gene sequencing and no mutations were identified. Therefore, they still have malignant hypothermia susceptibility because it happened and we know, you know, again, the gold standard test is a muscle contracture test for this reason. Um, and as I mentioned, 20 to 30 percent of families will have a negative result, even though we know that they have malignant hypothermia susceptibility. In these situations, the genetic testing is not useful for other family members because we're saying we don't know the cause of the malignant hypothermia in this family. And then if family members want to know their status, their risk, they'd have to use the muscle contracture test to know for sure. Okay. So the main takeaway point I wanted you guys to have on this portion is that failure to detect a pathogenic mutation on genetic testing does not rule out susceptibility, MH susceptibility. So in that example where I said we're testing someone who's had an MH event, if they have a normal genetic test result, we can't ignore the fact they had an MH event. They're still MH susceptible. Genetic testing is not perfect. That's kind of the moral of that story. So the challenges in interpreting genetic test results. The scenarios I've been giving you up until this point are all with an individual who's had an MH event or a positive contracture test. Where it really becomes a challenge is if the first person in the family to be tested has not had an MH event or a, has not had a contracture test. Um, because we don't know if they're MH susceptible or not going into it. So if they have a normal test, um, we really aren't sure what that means because we haven't had a genetic explanation for MH in the family yet. Um, and so this is one of the, the biggest challenges um, when we can't identify the gene in the family um, and, and someone who's, who's unaffected who never has had an MH event wants to know their risk the genetic testing has very limited value in this role. And really, again, they have to consider the muscle contracture test if they want more certainty in defining their, their risk for malignant hypothermia susceptibility. Okay. All right, and then the third option, as I mentioned, is no testing. Um, and so I have fam several family members that have done this um, where the individual or the family decide not to pursue genetic testing or muscle contracture testing. You know, there was an event, 
it was an it was definitely MH, and in that case, the the whole family is just being treated as MH susceptibility susceptible until proven otherwise. Okay, so questions on the genetic testing and interpretation section. Okay, Jenny, you knew there'd be some. Okay, um, there's one here that I I think um, you know you've stated, but I'd just like to have you uh, re-clarify uh, this for the audience. The person says, since genetic testing is site specific, and I know I'm MH positive based on the muscle biopsy, is it recommended that I also have the genetic test to find the mutated gene? So when my te when test so that when we test my daughter, they know where to look. Yes, so that is a great question. So the muscle contracture test was diagnostic and told us, okay, that is an individual who is MH susceptible, but we don't know the genetic reason. And so oftentimes the best strategy is really for that individual who has a positive contracture test to also do the genetic testing, which seems a little redundant, you know, for patients to think, well, why do I need the genetic test as well? I already had the positive contracture test. But if we can prove what the gene mutation is in that individual with a positive contracture test and find that exact spot, that exact site on the ryanidine receptor gene, then we can offer a simple blood test to subsequent family members, and in this case, the daughter, to say yes or no in the blood test, do you have the gene or not? Okay, great. Um, okay, and I think at this point you have answered everything else um, that kind of came in between um, in the presentation. So we can move right along. Okay, so this all will tie back into now the genetic testing strategy. Um, so I just wanted to put this sign up here, this slide up here um, as a resource um, for individuals. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it's important that the diagnosis of an MH event is confirmed. Um, I've had lots of family members contacting me over the years where, you know, there was, you know, it was 30 years ago, something happened in, in the operating room, and it isn't really quite clear what was going on. And then we go back and look at records, and, and it actually doesn't meet criteria for an MH event. Um, there are multiple different things that can go wrong, so to speak, in the operating room, multiple different reasons that someone would have a rapid heart rate during a surgical procedure. Um, and so I just wanted to list here the specific signs for MH and the nonspecific signs. And the Malignant Hypothermia Association has published like a scoring mechanism so that um, physicians can review records and determine what the likelihood is that an MH, that an event that happened, a surgical event um, that happened was actually an MH event or an event during a procedure and not due to some other um, adverse anesthesia reaction or other complication in surgery or, or during a procedure. Okay, so the indications for testing. So this is also something that the Malignant Hypothermia Association has put together. So for folks interested in the contracture test, if there's been a clinical history of an MH event, they would be a good candidate for the muscle biopsy test. If they've had a first degree relative with an MH event, um, and, and sometimes, unfortunately, this happens because the relative who had the MH event um, passed away at that time, and so they weren't available for the con muscle contracture test, and so then we look at those first-degree relatives. And first-degree relatives, by the way, is um, parents, siblings, children, okay? Um, or at-risk family members when the MH-causing gene variant is not known. So that's the example that I was giving when we have a normal genetic test result and we haven't been able to identify the gene mutation in the family, in those situations, the muscle contracture test is our only way to diagnose it in the family. So indications for genetic testing are similar. So if there's been a confirmed clinical episode of malignant hypothermia, 
um, if someone's had a positive contracture test, then they're also a candidate for genetic testing like the, um, the last question was asked about. Um, if they have a high likelihood of having experienced an MH episode, so again, this is that con confirming the diagnosis, um, and having a relative with a positive contracture test or known causing uh, MH causing pathogenic gene mutation. So those are the cases where we know the exact spot on the gene. Those individuals obviously as well would be good candidates for genetic testing. Okay. So, and then the strategy. So um, as, as I've been reiterating throughout, first ideally we would like to start with the genetic testing, the RYR1 gene sequencing in an individual who's had an MH event or a positive contracture test, okay? And from there, if the genetic testing is negative, if it's completely normal or even inconclusive, further genetic testing in the family will not be helpful, okay? So that is gonna be about 20 to 30% of families because as I mentioned earlier, about 70 to 80 percent of the time we're able to identify the mutation, which leaves us with 20 to 30 percent of families that we cannot identify the mutation and we have to resort to the contracture test as our only way of knowing for sure. However, for the 70 to 80 percent of um, families that have a positive genetic test where we're able to find the causative mutation for malignant hypothermia, then we've identified it, we know exactly the spot on the gene, the site specific, and further family members can be tested with the blood test, with the genetic test, okay? So really, um, in families where we know that there's um, malignant hypothermia, the ideal circumstance is that we get a positive genetic test, that we identify the mutation in someone who's had malignant hypothermia event. Um, it, it, it's kind of an inverse to think who wants a positive or an abnormal result, but we already know the MH event happened, so we can't undo that. If we can explain why it happened, then we can help other family members. And that's all about, you know, getting more information and, and being proactive and being prepared. So, Next step, so if, if, if for those of you on the call who um, have thought about genetic testing but maybe haven't done it yet um, or are interested in doing it, I really recommend people collect medical records, family history information as much as possible and keep, keep those records in a safe place at your home. Um, typically hospitals only retain medical records for maybe 20 years or so, um, so it's very difficult to get these records as the years go by. Um, talk with your doctor, let them know about the family history of MH, um, and then find a genetic counselor. And this website, the National Society of Genetic Counselors, has a find a counselor link where you can type in your zip code, your city, state, um, and they'll find you a genetic counselor near your home that can help assist with the genetic testing process. So with that, I will take additional questions. Okay, Jenny, um, there's one that I have here from um, previously. I just wanted to um, bring it out because uh, it may need a little clarification um, quickly. Once the gene causative to MH is identified, can my family members be genetically tested using a mouse swab? Oh, great. So it has to do with sample collection. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so it depends on the laboratory. So each genetic testing laboratory is validated for certain samples, um, and most laboratories do offer a mouse swab or a saliva collection kit that, that we can do. Um, some people are very um, needlephobic, adverse to having their blood drawn, or sometimes in the case of small children, it's just a lot easier to do a buckle swab than it is to um, needle stick a small child. Um, so it, it depends on the laboratory, but typically in most cases, yes. And it's just as accurate, so a, a buckle swab or a saliva collection is just as accurate as a blood sample. The only thing is that if you, you have to make sure you collect enough of the specimen, otherwise you can have a specimen failure where you have to submit another specimen. Um, with blood, we usually don't have that issue because you get, get enough blood to get enough good DNA isolated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that is all I have at this point, so we can certainly move forward. 
Okay, so there were some questions that were submitted um, previously that I just want to make sure we address because I think they uh, hit home some of the key points of the presentation. Um, so someone had submitted a question asking, what are the current guesses about how this disorder begins in a family line? I'm the first person in my family to test positive for MH, and there's no family history to support this diagnosis. So it goes back to that inheritance that they said earlier. So mutations that are brand new in a family lineage are called de novo. Um, for malignant hypothermia, we know this is a very rare event. Um, the, the studies have not quite been done to determine how rare it is, but this is a very rare event within malignant hypothermia that the mutation would be completely brand new in the individual and neither mom nor dad carries the gene. Um, the more likely scenario is that either mom or dad was the carrier, it's in one of their lineages, and they, they were MH susceptible, but maybe they never had an event or never exposed to a triggering agent, again, because of the multifactorial nature of what precipitates an MH event. Um, if they had never had you know, surgery and never exposed to a triggering agent, um, even if they were, even if they did have exposure to a triggering agent, um, for, for whatever reason, again, this is our, how we have to further understand MH and a lot more research is needed. You know, an individual who's MH susceptible could have unknowingly been exposed to triggering agents five times before and then on that sixth time, for whatever reason, boom, they have an event. Um, so there's just more to the story that we have to uncover yet. So um, even if the, an individual feels like, wow, I must be the first person in my family, it's likely the gene goes back. It was just kind of hiding, if you will, um, because the gene does not guarantee an MH event. It merely um, confers a susceptibility. All right. So question number two. Um, the person submitted, I had an MH-related uh, episode during a surgery 25 years ago. At the time, the doctors thought it was an allergic reaction to the anesthesia due to the lack of knowledge of MH at that time. Should my immediate family members be tested since I now have been diagnosed with MH? So this gets to what I was saying earlier, is trying to obtain those records. So 25 years ago, we're kind of right on the cusp of when hospitals start destroying records. Um, and, and get either a consultation with the physician or, or with co in contact with MHAUS to clarify what happened and actually go through and looking at those MH-specific indications um, versus other non-specific um, anesthesia reactions that can happen. Um, and if an MH event is confirmed, then we would like to start with genetic testing that individual. If we find a genetic mutation, then we can subsequently offer genetic testing to the family. Okay. And that brings us to the conclusion of the previously submitted questions. Has anybody can't come up with any other questions? I think this is going to be our last opportunity to submit questions. Okay, Jenny, I'm not seeing any. You must be doing an excellent job. <laughs> That's what I always say. <laughs> Well, so luckily, I, Tina has not prepared a quiz for everybody to take <laughs> the pass or not. <laughs> no, no, we're just having open for questions for a few minutes. No more polls. Okay, okay. Well, and with that, then, I would like to thank everyone for their time and attention today for this very important topic. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions come in, but please remember that if you should have another question, you can always email us, um, contact us on our website, or just um, put it on Facebook, so Twitter, wherever you would like, and we will do our best to get to it. Um, one last thing before we end the webinar. I would like to ask you all to complete the short survey that will pop up on your screen when you close the control panel using the X in the top right corner. Thank you very much for your time. I'm going to pass this over to Diane Doherty for a quick word. Hi, everyone. Uh, you've heard me a little bit in the background, but I just wanted to take a moment to thank Jenny for sharing all this valuable insight on the intricacies of the genetics of MH in a way we can all more easily understand. I hope everyone attending is able to take away at least one thing that clarifies this often confusing topic. So you know, MHOS plans to provide more webinars designed for patients and their family members throughout the year. 
we intend to focus on a single topic for each in order to allow time enough for thorough responses. There will always be time for impromptu questions and answers, and we encourage those from you. Please keep an eye on the MHouse website at uh, mhaus.org for future announcements of upcoming events. We'll try to share them early enough to allow you ample time to plan your attendance. In addition, please consider becoming a member of MHouse. Patient membership is only $35 a year. We're a membership-based nonprofit organization focused on assuring patient safety from a devastating MH event, and we uh, encourage further research on MH, as Jenny mentioned, that's much needed. Members are given discounts on most items and are kept informed on MH through a quarterly newsletter sent either in hard copy or via email. Our website offers all kinds of MH information and a direct way to reach us via the contact button at the very top of the site. Feel free to ask a question whenever you need to. We, of course, welcome donations to MHouse as they provide a solid base for us to continue to offer webinars like this one and other MH educational topics. Thank you all for attending, and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the day and week.